Hello, everyone. Um, here we are again, still in chapter six. I'm looking at uh, the slides, but also the R Markdown source document. We will go ahead and start with the source document. I'm at line 462 of the slides. Uh, we're looking at chance of a triangle. So you will recall uh, that we wrote a function back in chapter three for deciding if um, three side lengths can make up a triangle. That function is, is triangle that we see right here. Uh, if you click on the little right arrow, then you can teach that function to your global environment. You see it's over here is triangle. How nice. So you'll recall that uh, this function worked on many triangles at once. Uh, if you set the A sides of the um, triangles into uh, a vector called A or anything you like really, and the B sides into another vector and the C sides into yet another vector, then you could uh, check to see whether all the triples of the sides uh, made triangles. Let's give it a try. And so we see that the, the two, four, five sides do make a triangle because it says true. The 413 also makes a triangle. The 7, 2.8, and a 12 uh, does not, and so on. So um, have in mind uh, to make a random process around this. Suppose that you take a stick that is one foot long and you break it randomly in two places, then you would have three uh, pieces out of the stick. And I have a little question, what's the probability that the three pieces will form a triangle? We're gonna answer this question with simulation. So we need to, to model the situation. Uh, what you can do if you want to model breaking a stick once, is to simply choose two random places along the stick to do the break. I'm letting the first one be X, the second one be Y. Okay, and notice that each of them is a random uniform number, just one of them, that's the one inside the parentheses. The default values of our UNIF are that the min is zero and the max is one. So you are indeed choosing a random number between zero and one each time you run our UNIF. I am then sticking the two together into a vector with names X and Y for its elements. Let me give it a try. And so I broke at 0.64 and at 0.39. Now we need to make the pieces. Um, I'm gonna say that the A piece is the smaller of those two breaks. So I can see with my eyes that it's going to be that second one, the 0.39. Here we are making the A piece. The B piece is the larger of, is formed by the larger of the two breaks. So uh, we'll make those in a moment. We will then uh, set, we'll make a new vector here that's named. The first element is zero, its name is left-hand side. The second element is our A, the third element is our B, and the last element, we'll call it right-hand side, is a one. Let's run this particular piece of code. And so you see zero, the 0.39, the 0.64, and the one. So we want to figure out what are the lengths of the pieces that are made from these two breaks. Um, piece one shall be a minus zero. So that'll turn into a 0.39. Piece two shall be b minus a. So that's the 0.64 minus the 0.39. That's about 0.25. And the third piece is the one minus the B. So that's that break on the very right-hand part of the stick. And that's a, a one minus 0.646, and it's about a 0.35. So these three pieces, do they make a triangle? 
Well, we can feed them in as arguments to the is triangle function, and we find out that in this case, they do. So that models the process of breaking a stick and checking to see if the pieces make a triangle. What we need to find out uh, is the probability of a triangle, so we need to uh, be able to repeat this process a number of times. Fortunately, both RUNIF and is triangle work in a vectorized way, so they can handle this repetition quickly and easily. For the sake of this next example, we're just going to repeat this random process eight times. Uh, so we're going to make eight first breaks and eight second breaks. Here they are. And then we need to get those uh, left hand breaks and right hand breaks out of the two breaks. And so we need to get the minimum of uh, each of the uh, pairs and the maximum of each of the pairs. This is done with a special function called pmin and another special function called pmax. Um, let's go ahead and uh, run this code and see what's happening. So x and y are the vectors you see up here. The first element of x was 0.64. The first element of y was a 0 0.0025. So when we do the p min of x and y, the first element of that p min, which is the a vector that you see here, is the 0 0.0025. The second element of the x vector was 0.39. The second element of the uh, y vector was 0.62. And so it's the 0.39 that's going to be the minimum showing up as the second element of A, and so on. And B, which is the Pmax of X and Y, works in the same way, taking the maxima pair by pair. The side ones would be the A minus zero, which is just an A. The side twos would be B minus A, and the side threes would be the one minus B, the rightmost sides. So those aren't displayed here in the output, uh, but we will take those three um, sets of sides and feed them into his triangle. And we find out that sometimes we get a triangle and sometimes we don't. So here's a small function that will uh, do this job. Um, straight from the original breaks so that we uh, don't have to keep repeating all of that A and B work. So it's a little function of X and Y, and those are your first and second breaks. And uh, A is the P min, B is the P max, and then side one, side two, and side three vectors are constructed in the same way. And the final uh, item in the body of the function is just to do is triangle on those uh, three side sets. So we'll teach this to our global environment. And then um, uh, let's give it a try. After all, we have the x and y uh, vectors up here from this code chunk that are eight long. So we'll feed them in as the x and y uh, values for the parameters x and y. And we get those same answers very quickly. So I'm going to head back to the slides and uh, we'll carry on from there. I'll catch us up to where we were. The following is just a table that shows us how all of this worked out logically for our um, little x and y vectors, both of length eight. So the first column are the breaks, the eight, the eight uh, x breaks, the eight y breaks. 
Um, and so on the first row, you see that you broke the stick at 0.64 and at 0 0.002. That meant that the first side from zero to the smaller, the 0 0.002, was 0 0.0025. The second side is the 0.646 minus the 0 0.002, and it's about 0.644. And the third side is that one minus the 0.646. Uh, 646, and that's about the point 0.353. And those three sides did not make a triangle. In the same way, we uh, have for each of the other seven uh, side pairs whether or not they made a triangle. So we now are interested in estimating the probability of uh, making a triangle off of the data that we have so far. So I would suggest uh, running the makes triangle function, but putting the results into some uh, nice named vector. How about triangle? Now, triangle is a bunch of true and falses, but when you take the sum of a logical vector, the trues are converted to ones and the falses to zeros. Turns out there were three trues. So three times out of the eight, we had a triangle. Um, if you take the mean of triangle, then you're dividing that 3 by the length of triangle. You're dividing 3 by 8, 0.375, 3 out of 8. That is our best guess right now at the probability that when you randomly break a stick that's one foot long into two places, that you'll get a triangle, 37.5%. So uh, why don't we go ahead and encapsulate our work into another little function. We'll call it triangle sim. It's a function of one parameter, reps. That's how many sticks you're going to break into two pieces. The default value is apparently 10,000. Um, cut one, that's like the x. It's our uh, first break. Cut two is our second breaks. And then we just uh, run makes triangle on cut one and cut two. And so we'll have a big long vector of trues and falses. And here we are just uh, catting out a little message to the user. The proportion of triangles was mean of triangle. And that's our estimate for the probability. So we were gonna, you, you should uh, check this out by teaching it to your global environment and then we'll see what happens next. Um, it might be interesting, in addition to having just an estimate of the probability, to maybe get a little table that says how many times the three sides made a triangle and how many times they did not. So uh, if you wanted to add that extra feature, then maybe before you finish off the function, uh, you could make that table if the user wants it. We'll do this using a second parameter called table, and our default value for it shall be false. But if the user sets it to true, if table, then we'll cat out. Here's a table of the results. And then we'll print the table of a triangle. The R function table will tally up those uh, trues and falses. And we'll make a little uh, extra blank space before we cut out the uh, estimate of the probability of getting a triangle. So if you wished, you could uh, teach that to uh, your global environment. Give that a try. Uh, if you do give it a try out, uh, then um, setting the table to true and using the default of 10,000 reps, then you might get results like this. And you'll notice that about 25% of the time, we got triangles. Um, there's an issue that I want to bring up, though. Uh, whenever you do random stuff uh, using RUNIF or sample or some of these other random functions we'll learn about from time to time, the results are going to be different each time. For example, just, just run this command several times. Sample colors size is one. We did that a few weeks ago. And you remember that we got a, a different name color every time. 
but uh, it's sometimes nice to keep uh, your random licking results the same so that uh, maybe you could talk about them, discuss them, have, you know, and, and know what you're going to be looking at. If you want to do that, then you can uh, set the random seed for R's random number generator. This is done with a function called set seed. It takes as argument an integer. I suggest using just some four digit, four digit integer that you like. And if you were to set the seed and then try one of these random functions, you'll get a random looking result, but it'll be the same random looking result every time. Let's uh, give that a try back in R Studio. So we look for setting a seed. Here we go. So in this uh, particular code chunk, the seed was 3030. And uh, when I tried uh, sampling from colors, I got light sky blue three. And actually the slides are a bit out of date. This is a different version of R than when I made those slides. And so um, you don't get floral white. You're gonna get light sky blue three every time you try this. Watch, let me try it again. Whoa, see, light sky blue three. But on the other hand, if you started out with a different seed, like if I set the seed to 4343 43 and sampled from colors, then I get this other random looking result, but it really will be the same every time I give it a try. I just won't escape the sea green too. So um, you can uh, use this idea In the following way, you could just add an extra little parameter to your triangle sim function called seed, and the user sets it to some integer. And the first thing the function does is set seed to whatever seed was provided, and then does the rest of triangle sim. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, teach that to the global environment and try it out. And if you just try it out every time, you see that you're just going to get the same results every time. But I think another nice feature, it would be nice to have the option to call triangle sim without having to provide a seed. And uh, here's a suggestion for doing that. Let the default value of seed when you define the function be null. And then you can just check to see if the seed is null or not. There's a nice function called is.null. And if the seed is not null, then you set seed to whatever seed was provided by the user. On the other hand, if the user doesn't mention seed when they call the function, you'll skip over this if entirely, and you'll go ahead and just do the rest of the function. Let's teach this function to our global environment and try it out. I'm gonna try it out once with a seed of 3030 and another time with no seed. And you see that uh, each time I, I got different results, I'm gonna try it again. And you'll notice that the 3030 seed function stays at 0.2547 as the estimate for the probability of a triangle, whereas the um, the other one can just keep changing. Here I am just running. I'm just putting my cursor at triangle sim and just running it. And you see that uh, I get a different thing every time. So back to the slides, um, there we go. What we've just done, where we successively added features to the function is uh, the process that you call encapsulation generalization. 
it's a basic method for developing a computer program where you first design your basic procedure and then you encapsulate it into one or more functions as we're used to doing. But then once you've got a working function, you keep adding features to the function. In R, you might do that by adding more parameters that allow the user to have more choices in what the function does and how it works. So you have a little um, practice with encapsulation and generalization here involving uh, the um, little quiz show game. And you can try that on your own. Next time, we'll look at another simulation involving uh, two people trying to meet at a coffee shop. See you then.